All right. I'm here today with Mandy Graziano. She's the VP of Global Accounts for HPN. She's also the author of, as you can see there, Sales Tales, The Hustle, Humor, and Lessons Learned from a Life in Sales. How are you doing today, Mandy? Awesome. Thanks for having me on the podcast today. Well, I'm very excited to get you here. Um, you know, one of the things I love uh, about this show is that we get a chance to be able to showcase uh, not only our industry and 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 the players in this industry, but we also get to tell some great stories. And in looking over your background, uh, you know, I've talked to dozens and dozens of people that have, you know, great career stories. You know, I look at yours and and I'd love for you to walk us through how you went from, you know, site-based sales, uh, you know, to, to you know, what you're doing with, with HPN and, and, you know, then of course the author and, and just where you're at right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to yield the floor to you and just kind of introduce yourself and, and walk us through that. That would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a, it's a long and, uh, road full of trips and stumbles. I'll tell you that over the last 20, 20 plus years, I never had intended on being in hospitality, but I fell into it and I fell in love with it. And I captured the hospitality disease, the illness that I think most of us that end up here, we all have, and I've, I've stuck with it. Um, so, you know, back in the, back in Ohio, you back where I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, I am one of my first, not my first sales job. My first sales job is actually in the book. It was not in hospitality and I got fired from that job. <laughs> but um, one of my first uh, hospitality jobs was I was a marketing manager for a banquet and conference center in Cleveland, Ohio. And we only had space. And so we did a lot of cross promotions with, uh, with hotels, a lot of limited stay hotels or um, that, you know, the courtyards, residence inns and the, you know, Hilton properties. So a lot of the standalone, you know, they, they gave us the rooms, we had the space and we worked a lot together then. And then I made a New Year's resolution, 1999, Y2K, world's supposed to explode. I want a free trip to Dublin, Ireland by filling out one of those forms that the bar girls give you. And, um, and it was a radio station giveaway and my roommate won. She brought me as her guest. And so we went to Dublin, Ireland, Y2K. It was this awesome wow. experience. So I made a New Year's resolution. And that resolution was to get out of Ohio by the time I was 25. My birthday was in August. I had eight months to figure it out. And I knew that I was obsessed with hotels because every time you check into a hotel, it could be at 3 a.m. or it could be noon. Somebody has to welcome you with a smile and solve your problem and get you into your room and get you a good night's rest. So I was really interested in that. So I just started applying to a whole bunch of hotels all over the country. I had never worked in a hotel. I was super underqualified. I only had two <laughs> years of marketing under my belt at this venue in this mom, pa type shop venue. Um, it was huge space. They had like 40,000 square feet of space, but still compared to the rest of the, the country, it was, it was small. And um, San Diego was the only place that would call me back. <laughs> and so in June, I flew out on a buddy pass. A friend of mine, um, her uncle or something were for United. I paid my $50. I overnighted in the, in the um, airport, in the Dulles airport at that time. Because, you know, you fly on a buddy right. pass, you're just waiting for the next flight. Right. And I came to San Diego in June and I just, I fell in love with the city. I interviewed at all these different hotels I had absolutely no experience. I actually had one GM tell me, you have no experience. <laughs> Why should I hire you? And I told him, I was like, listen, people put their pants on one leg at a time. I am not afraid to talk to anybody, whether it is somebody at the staff level or somebody at the C level. And I am not moving back to Ohio. So I have motivation to stay here and work hard and do a good job. And he's like, I like you. You have no experience. I have no idea why, but I'm going to hire you. He's like, give me a couple weeks so I can find a job for you. I'm like, okay. So I went back to, to Ohio. I said, I'm moving. And uh, a couple months later, loaded up 25 foot moving truck and, you know, came to San Diego. And I had a job at the Sheraton San Diego two weeks later as a catering sales manager, which I didn't have any experience in catering. And, and luckily, this is Starwood at the time. They had an awesome training program, really good culinary wine pairing. Prior to that, I'd only had wine at church. And I thought red wine just like reminded me of the Catholic church. It grossed me out. 
<laughs> so I, you know, I was a beer girl. I grew up in Cleveland. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, I learned a lot and I was coming from behind and my team did not like me at all because they were like, who is this girl? Um, the, the rose colored glasses. I had all these binders. I was all organized. They didn't like me. And then I just sort of rose through the ranks. I left. Um, I did a really good job as catering salesperson. I did all the bar and bat mitzvahs, the military events, all the things, and then went over to group sales a couple years later and then did, you know, all of the group sales things at the hotel side. And then eventually um, I got all the awards, salesperson of the year, all the things, right? And then I, for Starwood, went on the trips, got the taste of that, left there. I worked for a, um, a company that all we did were we um, managed these private event venues and, and it was all over San Diego and the venues really focused on club nightclubs and clubs but when we were dark during the week it was my job my team's job to fill the venue right as a director of sales there so um that was awesome that was stingery in san diego so that was like steps away from the convention center and that's really where i learned how to be an entrepreneur um because worked with the chef you know we didn't have a national sales team we did it was just me and my team that i managed of four or five people and we went out and we um, found the business and booked these huge buyouts for the 30,000 square foot venue. Um, and then, you know, worked with the chef on the menus, worked with the operators on profitability. And then through that, then these, um, the people that own the company, they started then going out and finding other venues. So in that sense, I got to do competitive analysis, market condition analysis, pricing, all that, all that good stuff that I love to do. And then um, I left there. I missed hotels and it was a ton of work at the private event venue side. Um, and I missed hotels. So I went back to hotels and that's um, when I opened up the Hard Rock Hotel in San Diego. I was account director there. So I was you know, just under the director of sales and I loved it because I wasn't in charge of anybody, but they let me do whatever I wanted. And I had a, <laughs> a market and it was a great market at the time as West Coast and um, so I was there, then I went to Caesars Entertainment in Las Vegas. And then at that point I had fallen in love and, um, I met my husband now, but the boyfriend I met, I came, when I came back from my interview in Las Vegas, we went on a date a week later, I got offered a job while we were on the date. And he's like, you're moving. This is the worst first date I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> and so we continued dating, but then, you know, I went to Caesars, you know, I managed a, a huge team of people and, you know, like the, the zeros are a lot big, you know, it's a, more than a million square feet of space, seven hotels, just tons of rooms. And then, um, you know, booked a ton of business in that short time I was there, but it got hard. I kept coming back to San Diego. He kept coming to Las Vegas. I wasn't going to make him move to Vegas. And finally I decided I'd move back to San Diego. And um, in the process of thinking about that move, HPN, their CEO called me, Bill Kilberg, who is a great mentor and friend still to this day. And he was before too. And he's like, I heard you fell in love. It's time to come to HPN. Are you ready to come <laughs> to the other side? He's like, you can, you can work in San Diego. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Another one of my mentors, Julie Dunkel, at the time had jumped from Starwood. She was in global sales and she jumped from Starwood to HPN a couple years prior. And she called me and she's like a big sister. And she's like, Mandy, <laughs> you've been on the hotel site. It's too long. You, you can't go any further. You're kind of burnt out, like just come to the side. And so in 2010, I went from selling hotels for conferences to being a buyer of conferences okay. and um, finding venues and hotels for my clients all over the world, which I love so much more because I'm not confined to one hotel or one hotel brand. Now I can solve all their problems, just that right. one of their problems. And I've been with HPN on that side for 12 years now. Okay. So that's a, that's the hotel side. And then we've got the, the coaching and the author side that I'm sure we can dip into as well. So. Awesome. Well, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, you've definitely got a, a, a great perspective on how the industry goes right now. Right. Um, you know, yeah. the, our audience, you know, we, we have all kinds of people listening to us, you know, as an operations guy myself, we have a lot of operations people sitting here. So, you know, if we started there and then, and then kind of got our way to sales and we talk more about your book and, and, and some of the things there, but if we started with operations right now, you know, a lot of things have changed since the pandemic. Uh, you know, there's kind of like a pre pandemic and post pandemic is kind of how we all think about things now. Yeah. 
Um, you know, based on your, your, you know, macro view of the industry right now, you know, what kind of, what kind of trends are you seeing? What kind of information could you give to uh, uh, GMs and operators out there, uh, you know, to kind of help them get a better perspective on how things are going these days? Yeah, I, I think um, it's for GMs and asset managers and operators just in general, it is um, listen to your salespeople and, and don't just go into their office and be like, how are you doing today? Right. Because the salesperson is going to be like, I'm great. Here's all my P and T's. But like, in, but like, really, how are you doing? Like what? And, and, and maybe even be less boring, like remove how are you doing off the table? Right. Get clever and say, what makes your job difficult right now? Or what do you love about your job right now? And then give them the space to be honest and authentic with you. I think right now, because so many salespeople, they got furloughed and laid off. So if they're back on property or if they're back in their role, they're afraid that they're going to be fired again or laid off. So I, I think GMs and operators can do whatever they can to authentically give the people on the team and not just salespeople, just space to be authentic with them and give feedback. Cause I think now more than ever operators have to really listen to what's going on because it's different. People have changed. Customers have changed. The, the, the makeup of a meeting has changed. And I think you have to give people that space. So I think listening and truly listening to what they're, you know, what people are saying, your, your, your leaders are saying is important. Um, and I think arm, arm your staff, with as much information as you can. And I don't mean shove them in a four hour training. That's the last <laughs> thing they need right now. In fact, that's something that makes me crazy because I, you know, conferences are back and I, my clients, you know, we are sourcing so many RFPs right now. And so many salespeople are in four hour tra all day trainings. It's like, oh, okay, man. there's such, there's way better ways to train people than shoving them in a four hour training and taking them out of the field, right? Like right now they need to be talking to customers, building relationships, booking business, you know, ca calling people that they haven't worked with in a while, be saying, hey, wh what's happened? What's changed? How are you, how are you different? How are you the same? Um, so I think arming them with resources. Um, I think time management is a major issue right now with everybody because a lot of hotels are still short staffed. And, right. um, but there's quadruple the business or even more than quadruple the business. So just getting back to that basics of like, when you're running a business, when you have so much business and not enough staff, what do you do? How do you do it? Um, so I, I think arming them, um, with the resources they need. And then I also think empowering them to make decisions, you know, right now on my side, there's nothing more cringeworthy when someone's like. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Now, I love that if they don't know an answer, they say, I don't know. And they'll get back to you instead of making one up. That's a good thing. But, you know, empowering people to quote a rate and make a decision and, and you know, agree, give them swaps for contract negotiations, right? If a client won't agree to these five things, here are five good swaps that you can do. And then you could do it right there on the phone instead of, us waiting six to eight hours for somebody to get back. Cause sometimes we lose the business because we just don't have the time to wait for that right now. So I think um, listening, arming and empowering the staff as much as you can, I think would be my greatest advice to GMs and operators right now. That's awesome. Cause I, I know that it's funny. Cause you, you, you mentioned the GM who walks in and is like, Hey, how you doing? Yeah, that was me. I, for so, for so long, that was exactly what I did. And, and what was the response? What response? Oh, everybody was fine. Oh, Hey, let me show you what I just booked. And we're good. Oh, you know, then I get them out of the office and you know, it was, yeah, I, I get that. So that, that is great feedback. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I know as operators right now, you know, obviously there's, there's, there's tons of issues out there that everybody's dealing with. Uh, one of the things they're not doing is swinging, as you said, swinging back around to sales, right? Having those authentic, having those genuine conversations. They're basically just looking at sales to put heads in beds, right? Uh, you know, fill the space, put heads in beds, just do what you do. Cause I, I can't even clean the rooms right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I've got, right, I don't know right. if people even clean the rooms right now. I'm sleeping four hours and I don't have enough staff and I've got owners here and I got a P and all to worry about. No, I totally get that. So, so you know, I, I think in your, in your book, right. I think you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, 
business bedside manner, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so, so talk me through that, right? Because, you know, obviously there has to be, there has to be a better way to do, you know, have this communication, right? So talk me through that a little bit. I love talking about business bedside manner. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. <laughs> I love this term so much. I trademarked it. So this actually was born, business bedside manner was born out of a bike rant um, in San Diego, And it was in the middle of COVID and I was lifting and shifting. I ended up lifting and shifting or canceling 202 contracts um, from 2020 to 2022. And that's just my business. Like that's not speaking on behalf of HP and that's just my book of business. And so it, it was hard and I was busy and it was deflating, right? And I was, and I noticed people were being mean to each other and to me and they're just irrational. And they were really all about like, you're going to pay this cancellation because we lost all the money. It's like, dude, I get it. I get you lost all the money, but like, let's take a step back for a second. My client who's been working so hard to produce a meeting can't have the meeting. Like they can't get together with a thousand of their employees and celebrate success and kick off the greatest possible year they thought they were going to have. Like, let's, let's look at that. Like I get, we're, we're going to pay your cancellation fee. I'm probably going to mitigate it down a bit or parlay it to a future piece of business. That's what I do. But, right. but like for a quick sec, can you think about what's going on in the mind of the client? Cause I'm thinking about what's going on in your mind. So business bedside manner is just, it's an approach. It's how do you approach business? Are you the type of person when somebody sees your name on their phone, they hit ignore because they don't want to talk to you. Are you the type of person when somebody sees your email come over, their gut drops because you're such an a-hole that nobody wants to deal with you? Like, who are you in business? What is your business DNA? And how can you listen better, be more empathetic, assume nothing, ask deeper, but better, more clever questions? So Um, business bedside manner, you know, if you look up bedside manner in the dictionary, right, Merriam Webster says, it's the manner to which a practitioner, a medical professional, you know, can sue the patient, right? But like, we've all been to the doctor before, especially lately, like you wait for 20 minutes in the waiting room, and you get into the doctor's office, and he comes in with the clipboard upside down, he asks you a bunch of information, (laughs) you've got a list, (laughs) you want to talk about because your body's changed since the last time you were there. A lot of us haven't been able to see our doctor in two years. So you've got the uh. list and the doctor's so interested in going over the, 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 the list that he has. He never really gets to your list or maybe gets a couple things on your list and then boom, appointment's over. So you have to think about like, how do you feel in that moment and translate that to business? Like, are we making our customers feel like that? Are we so busy with that we're only getting four hours of sleep and I don't have enough staff for the front desk and valet doesn't know what the heck they're doing and I've got really low GSI scores is that is our noise so busy that we're forgetting what's going on with the customer right we're forgetting to ask the question so business bedside manner is really just an approach if you don't have a business bedside manner you've got to create one if you think you have a business bedside manner You've got to redefine it because we've changed. The customers have changed, your vendors, your employees, just the whole way we do business has changed. So if you're doing business today, the same way you were in December, 2019, you were wrong. You're going to fail miserably. So it starts with your business bedside manner. And, you know, there's so many ways to retool it. Like it comes down to, instead of little things, like instead of saying, how are you today? Take it off the table and say, what made you laugh this week? Instead of, you know, how will the decision be made? Ask, what hurdles can we hop to help make an impactful decision? Like, it's just swapping out those boring, unclever questions, replacing with deeper, meaningful questions, and asking, even asking your employees. Like, right now, it's hard to keep employees in the hospitality business. It's hard to get employees. So the ones that you have, treat them like gold. Don't buy them champagne and give them a party. Go into their office and sit down and say, hey, how have you changed since you've come back from furlough? Like, why, what makes your job more difficult right now? What makes your job easier? Like, what do you love about being here? Those are the things that are going to open up some dialogue and make life a little better. So 
I've got like five questions I suggest you ask to create a better business bedside manner and then six tech hacks that I recommend implementing um, to create a better business bedside manner. But in general, it's all about practicing more empathy, being a better listener, asking better questions, and assuming nothing. Those are the four, what I consider the principles of business bedside manner. Uh, that is incredible. And I think that that's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's timely, uh, you know, and, and like you said, you know, it, it hit you during the pandemic, right? To be mm -hmm. honest with you, it's part of a larger conversation, which is, you know, the, the culture that exists within hospitality, part of what scares everybody about hospitality is, you know, the authoritative dictator, aloof leader, uh, you know, it, it, and, and, and that's like the the narrative that has been part of our industry for so long, regardless of where you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not just Gordon Ramsay and his authoritative kitchen style, right? It's, uh, you know, everybody's had one of those bosses. Everybody's had one of those leaders that you just, you know, you rub your head and you're like, you know what? I'm going to go down the street. I'm out, yeah. right? And, and you can't have that anymore. Uh, I've yeah. talked to so many leaders that have said the same thing. So, uh, you know, in your, in your, you know, as you're, as you're going through this and you're, and you're preaching this to everybody and you're, and you're going and you're talking to people about this, is it being well received? Yes. Yeah, it is. Well, it's, it's so funny because this was literally, like I said, a bike rant. I think I put the bike rant up on the blog because people are like, where did this come from? I, I copied and pasted it from the phone note. So it's not even pretty. Like I put, <laughs> and, and it grew from there, but yeah, it's very well received because I think we've all felt like that, right? We've all felt like we're not appreciated. We've all felt like, whoa, like I get you have a story, but I've got a story too. And there's two of us. So like, there's probably a third person in this. Like there's, there's the hotel, there's the customer, there's the salesperson, there's the vendors, there's all of these other people. So yeah, it's been really, really well received. And then I'm still learning different ways to practice bedside manner. I consider this, a, I hate the word journey. Maybe we'll call it an adventure. Like I consider this <laughs> an adventure that we all really, really need to really continue in pra to practice. So, you know, I think that that's definitely a key to, to us being successful. And, you know, I think as operators, that's, that's huge because operators are probably the worst offenders of having a, a horrible bedside manner when it comes to what it is that we do. Um, you know, if I am, if I'm now, you know, kind of switching gears here to sales, right. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of the same questions, right. You know, one question is, you know, what kind of trends are you seeing in sales? Because I know a, a lot of people are curious as to, you know, is business really coming this last minute? Um, you know, is it really just coming in these waves and torrents? Like, so, so what kind of trends are you seeing in sales right now? It's bananas. It's absolutely nuts. <laughs> I would say in the more than 20 years I've been in this business, I've never seen it as frantic as it is. Um, but there it's two ends of the spectrum. I've got one end of the spectrum where I have clients that are, they want to book a meeting. They've got to spend their money before the end of the year. They don't want to do a site inspection. They got to pay all the cash this year and boom, source it today, book it next week. And it arrives in three weeks, right? That's, that's one end. And that truly, that truly is happening. I'm literally working on like four or five of those deals, like right now, like right after we hang up this call, <laughs> but the other side that's happening, that's a completely different opposite thing. And I think it's difficult for salespeople to, to switch their brains on because throughout the day, they're going from this frantic behavior to this methodical behavior is there are more people involved in the decision making than right. ever before. There's a lot more spreadsheets than ever before. <laughs> so in the past, it might have been one or two people in the decision making. Now it's one or two people and the CFO and the CEO and sometimes even hotel owners, which um, I've talked to more hotel owners lately in the last year than I have in the last 20 plus years. So I think salespeople really have to like sit in the middle and just buckle up and be ready for the ride and say, okay, like this second, I'm going to frantically prepare everything I need to for this person. And in this second, I'm going to methodically be ready. But I think what salespeople could do is know the spectrum of what they're working with and, and prep themselves. So for like the methodical sale that's coming through right now is, create a pre-estimate invoice that already has formulas in it. So when somebody asks you quickly, you know, hey, can you show me pre-estimate invoice of what that total amount would be? In the past, 
we would only really need these for like the smaller meetings, never for the bigger meetings, because there's so much that adds on between the time things are booked to the actual program happens. Of course. Yeah. But now that's happening even for the larger meetings. The budgets have always happened, but to where the meeting planner is involved, that's a that's been a little more of a um, a dynamic situation where they're building that along the way and they're gathering information. So if I sat in a sales role at a hotel right now, I'd create a pre-estimate invoice template and boom, I can send that out. Because a lot of times, the faster somebody can get that to me, the quicker I'm, I'm buying that hotel. Um, and then the frantic sale is, you know, know your numbers, know your ceiling height, know what happens when you look outside the front door. A lot of these hotel salespeople right now, they're selling 20 hotels and it's really hard to know everything there is to know about 20 hotels. And I, I feel for them because I, you know, I experienced that when I was in Vegas, that was a lot of data to retain. Right. right. So have your cheat sheets, you know, put them up on your wall, have your cheat sheets, your total number of rooms, your largest ballroom, your, your ceiling height, the top three things in your city, just create some cheat sheets. So you're ready for that frantic sell um, and you're ready to go. So I think there's ways to manage both sides of it, but it is, it is fast and furious right now. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm busier than ever. And it's great, right? We've been waiting for this. This is, we get to do this. This is an avalanche <laughs> we've been waiting for. We're here. So like buckle up, buttercup. It's time to go. You know, <laughs> like it's, it's just prepare yourself for that. So, so in this avalanche, in this torrent, you know, I think one of the questions everybody wants to know is, are you seeing corporate business in there? Right. Yes. Because, okay. That's yes. like the one thing everybody asks about. Yes, so much corporate business. And it's interesting when I see, um, so I actually had meetings happening through 2020. I was doing, um, cause I had some government contractors that I worked with. I had some companies that actually, they provided, um, they provide resources to people during a catastrophe type thing. So, okay. um, so we were doing meetings in the bubble, right? Um, right. And so that was a whole other level of uh, education that I had to learn myself and then work with the hotel partners on. But corporate is back. Um, association is back. And yeah, business, business is busy. So, so as you know, people are, are, are leaning into this uh, business bedside manner, right? And they're, and they're looking to evolve. If you're a salesperson and you've always had this persona, right? You, you've, always, you've always known you, right? Then the pandemic happened. Everybody got furloughed. Everybody's tossed on their head. What are salespeople doing now to re to refine that that bedside manner on their side? Um, you know, especially when it comes to outward contact with business. I think some of them are doing a great job, and I think some of them are failing miserably. I mean, it just I think that's just normal, right? There's like a fine line between like the 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 warriors and the wimps, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, so I mean, I think the salespeople that are doing a great job. They're being creative. They're being clever. They're asking good questions. They're getting information quickly. They're staying organized. Um, I think that's a really important thing. And I think the salespeople that are doing a, an excellent job. They're, they're, they're educating us on their process. They're saying, I can't get this to you today. I can probably get this to you next Tuesday. And here's what's going to happen between now and next Tuesday. Because when a salesperson tells me that, I can go back to my customer and educate my customer on right. The market conditions. And so I've been spending a lot of time educating my customers on, you know, hotels are short staffed. We're going to be waiting a little bit longer than normal. Um, but your space is still on hold and right. the hotel still wants your business. Um, so I think <laughs> the great salespeople are communicating to me what I need to communicate to my customers. The bad salespeople are just they're my guess, and I don't know because I don't. I'm not big brothering anybody, <laughs> but my <laughs> guess is the bad salesperson is just getting into work, looking at their emails, and just responding to emails. Just like taking timestamp. orders, right? Just taking yeah. orders, and that's it. They're taking. They're not like they're not organizing emails from like highest revenue to lowest revenue, or shortest term to longest term, or top customer by name. Like they are letting their email rule them. They're not ruling their email. They're letting their day rule them. They're not ruling their day. Um, I think the great salespeople are like at the end of the day, they're they're making a list of the top five things they want to accomplish the next day, and they're they're focusing on that throughout the day. You know, I and I think it's hard. Like I I I am just as busy and as flemish as as sales as hotel salespeople are right now. Um, but you've got to schedule in your breaks. You've got to make time to breathe and work out and meditate or whatever that is that keeps you whole. 
Um, and I think, um, I think the good salespeople are, they're working through all of that. And I think they are doing things differently than they did before. You know, and my last question, like in the sales world, right, is, yeah. and it, this may sound really silly, but, uh, you know, with all the business coming in, are people still prospecting? Like, yes. are, okay. Okay. Is that like it, still a thing right now? It's still a thing. Oh, I'm still prospecting. I love, <laughs> I, and, and, and this is the best time to prospect because, a lot of people left the industry. So there's a lot less people doing what we're doing or even doing what the salespeople are doing. So there's a lot of abandoned customers right now. Right. There's a lot of orphan customers that need your help. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm still scheduling time to prospect um, twice a week. And I think it, this is a great time to catch up with customers on the hotel side, you know, like, and again, go back, do not send a customer, a, a email with like 25 questions, you know, <laughs> send a customer maybe with, with four words that are catchy in a subject line and then a couple questions in email. And, right. and maybe it is what made you laugh this week. I'd love to catch up. One's good for you. Simple. Right. Um, but I think um, prospecting now it's like, we're embarking right now on the greatest buying opportunity that we've had in the last 20 years. So yeah, don't just take the business that's coming to you. Go after what you want. Make that bucket list of like, who are the 20 customers and who are all the competitors you've always wanted to work with and go after it now because they're waiting for you. That's and and that's one of the things where, you know, you talk about the difference between uh, you know, people that are that are winning right now and people that are losing. And, yeah. you know, from everybody I've talked to that is that is struggling right now, they're sales department or order takers. They are not finding time to prospect. They can't convince their their ownership that's spending the additional dollars on somebody who can, you know, actually reach out and, and generate future business versus just taking all the orders that comes in is vital. Uh, even, you know, um, yeah, even just, um, even investing a little bit of money in somebody that's a relationship manager, don't even call them a salesperson, call them a relationship manager. And that's the person that calls anybody that's ever booked your hotel or your existing customers. And that call isn't about give me more business. That call is about how you been? <laughs> right. A lot's happened. I'm the relation. They just hired me. I'm the relationship manager for your account. And the hotel has asked me to call you to find out like, how is your life? Like how, how can we make your life better right now? Like something so little like that, somebody can do that from home. You yeah, know, like absolutely. customers want to be talked to right now. And I think um something just popped into my head going back to the business bedside manner is there's so much reciprocity in that, right? So, you know, and, and I'm making suggestions for the operators and the salespeople, and I love my hotel partners and I love the hotel operators. And there's a lot that we can do as customers too, to fine tune our business bedside manner, right? Like give some hotels the grace that they need for a couple extra days. Now I've done that all the way through like the beginning of 2022. And I would say in the last month, I've been saying, all right, I've given you the grace, like, <laughs> up. Time. Um, I've been doing that more now, um, but right. I, there are certain times when I can just feel that frustration from a hotel salesperson when they're like, my boss has been in a meeting. I can't get an answer. My revenue director says, no, the GM, I got to talk to, you know, and that's where I'm like, Hey, do, do what you have to do, but give me a super reasonable time frame so I can go back to the customer. So I think it's not just about the suppliers fine-tuning their business bedside manner. I think it's about the individual employee fine-tuning. How are they going to show up to work? And then, you know, buyers like me, it's about how, how am I exerting my business bedside manner? Not with just my customers, but with my partners out there too, the people that, you know, sell to me. That's outstanding. And, and I think that, you know, being cognizant of, of, you know, how you're portraying yourself, how, uh, you know, the, the, the feedback is coming back at you and then how you're able to adjust and grow out of that is hugely timely advice right now. And I think that that's definitely a focus for, for people. So, so Mandy, you know, I, I, I see your book, right. I've been looking at your book this whole time. There it, it is. <laughs> so, you know, my book's on its way, uh, you know, I've ordered it on Amazon. So what am, oh, what, what am I going to get when, when your book gets here? Tell me a little bit about it. Well, you're going to laugh. It's okay, a good. <laughs> Good and start. and since like you're, you have a hospitality background, you're probably going to relate to almost all the stories and you probably might even know some of the players in the book. Um, there, you know, it's a collection of stories over the last 20 years of sales and of business and they're true stories. So they're my stories as a buyer 
and as a salesperson, as a sales leader, and then also as a sales coach. So I've peppered in some other industries because I do coaching for executive coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching for people outside of the hospitality industry too. Um, so you're going to hear a whole bunch of those stories. And then it's stories about people that I admire in the industry or outside of the industry. So salespeople that I've interacted with over the years that I've watched them, like how they grow their business and how they build relationships. So it follows the standard order of a sale, um, but there's a couple story arcs to it. So it starts with prospecting, networking, building relationships, making a pitch, closing the deal. And um, then the, the last part of the book I added, um, I finished writing in 2019. And then because 2020 was going to be the best year ever. Of course it, oh, absolutely. Right. Did, did oh, we all yeah. feel like all that, that traveling, all those wonderful things that were going to happen. I totally understand yeah. that. Yeah. Like I flew to Detroit, Michigan, to the Shinola home base, right? The mothership to buy myself a watch. And I am not a jewelry watch person. I'm a like a clunky costumey jewelry person. Yeah. But I bought myself a nice watch as a congratulations for finishing a great year, finishing the book, because the next year was going to be the best ever. 2020 is going to be awesome. And obviously we know what we happened. Know what happened. 2020. Oh yeah, absolutely. And every time I look at that watch, I it's like a blessing and a curse. I'm like, this was great. Also a dumb idea because I got a lot of commission <laughs> checks I have to pay back. But anyways, that was a good lesson learned. But then 2020 happened. And what the gift of 2020, what 2020 really gave me was the disaster selling chapter. So that's the last chapter in the book. And the disaster selling chapter really talks about how to thrive and how to run your business during a crisis. And I hearkened back to September 11th, the auto crisis, um, and then COVID. And I shared a whole bunch of stories about that too. And then there's a great chapter in time management, actually chapter five, it's one of the longest chapters. Um, but I talk about my personal experience. I talk about um, my husband's near death experience 10 days before our wedding helped me be a better time manager in my business. And I've still taken on some of those practices. Um, I talked about how I was diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder in 2015, which is a chemical thing in my body. I never knew I had, apparently I've had since I was a kid and how like I learned from that, how to be a better time manager. So I talk about some personal stuff, but I also give some great like time management hacks too. So you're going to laugh. You'll really get to know me maybe more than you want, but there's a ton of hospitality stories in it too. And some great nuggets, great takeaways. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I always like to wrap up these uh, episodes with, with, you know, looking ahead at the future. Um, you know, if you are talking to somebody who's coming into hospitality right now, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you give them? I mean, have fun. You come on in. You're welcome. <laughs> we, we want you here. We need you here. And I think um, observe and be ready to learn a whole bunch of lessons. And then at the same time, be patient with yourself and, um, and just put your head down, work hard, smile, have fun. You know I mean? It's, it's a great, it's a great industry to be a part of, but you're not going to go, you, you can go places fast, um, but don't focus on going somewhere fast, really just be where your feet are Focus in the moment and enjoy it. Cause it's a, of all the industries that I've coached, it, hospitality is still one of the, the, sexiest and sweetest and the, and the most, um, the, the funnest, I would say most fun. Absolutely. That's phenomenal advice. I love it. Um, so Mandy, if people wanted to find out more about you, uh, find out uh, all the things you have going on right now, how do they do that? Uh, well, a couple of things. So my audio book just released a couple of weeks ago. So you can buy my audio book right now, super easy on audible or iTunes or wherever you buy audiobooks. Um, you can go to mandygraziano.com, Mandy with an I, Graziano with a Z. I actually answer all my emails and intake forms. So if you have a question or whatever, you can just email me there. Um, and then I'm on all the socials. Um, and I love engaging in conversations on LinkedIn, especially. I, I will pose questions every now and again. And I'm not posing it for myself. Like I'm truly interested in what people have to say. So um, follow me on LinkedIn and let's, let's have some conversations, um, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all the things. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mandy, I am really excited to, uh, to get your book. I am, I am really happy that we had this conversation today. So, me too. Uh, you know, I hope, uh, hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. This is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. This has been super fun. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, Mandy, you have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.